Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Garrett. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. Study Center, and on behalf of the center and our co-sponsor for this evening, the Australian and New Zealand School of Government, I want to welcome you all here and apologize, I have to say, for the tardiness of our start, which is all down to me, not to our distinguished <laughs> guest. Um, we're here tonight to look back and look forward, I think, regarding the Obama administration and what it means for, not only for America, but for Australia and the world. And I think it's fair to say that we couldn't have a more distinguished nor a more expert guide to Obama's world than Tom Mann. Uh, Thomas E. Mann is the Averill Harriman Chair and Senior Fellow in Governance Studies at the August Brookings Institution, and he's in Australia, in at least in no small measure, uh, to support and to interact with the new Grattan Institute in Melbourne. And I, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to say that the new CEO of the Grattan Institute, John Daly, is with us this evening. John, great to have you here. Uh, so Tom, Tom's at the Brookings Institution. What are we calling now the Grattan Institute? Brookings by the Yarra. Uh, it's got a nice ring to it. Um, Tom has been at Brookings for quite a while now. Um, before he assumed his chair, he was the director of, of uh, governmental studies at Brookings. And before that, uh, he was the ex executive director of the American Political Science Association. He did his undergraduate education at the University of Florida, Florida and received his MA and PhD from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, he's taught at most of uh, America's great universities, including Princeton, Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, Virginia, and American University. Uh, he's a prolific author, uh, so prolific it probably uh, it would take the rest of the evening to describe what he's written. He just <laughs> reminded me, and I think this is quite extraordinary for somebody who's been in the think tank world, Tom's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, as an academic, I know what a high honor that is. Uh, he's also a member of the prestigious New York-based Council on Foreign Relations, and he has won over time, two important prizes awarded by the American Political Science Association, the Frank Goodenow Prize and the Charles E. Merriman Prize. And I, I did uh, just want to highlight one of Tom's books, which has just been updated and reissued, co-authored with uh, Norman Ornstein, another extraordinarily uh, important scholar of the American political process, um, which I think it's fair to say is probably at the moment the most influential and important book on the legislative process in the U.S. with a fantastic and evocative title, <laughs> The Broken Branch, How Congress is Failing America and How to Get It Back on Track, uh, something I think we might return to, Tom, in, uh, as we talk about Obama. So let me segue from an introduction to Tom Mann uh, to the conversation, but since this was supposed to be an introduction and I should be moving from the podium to here, we should take a moment, I think, to welcome our distinguished guests. So, Tom, it's a real <laughs> pleasure to have you in Sydney and at Sydney University. So, if we could, if we could move on to, uh, to Obama's world, uh, I, I, want to, I want to ask you about politics and policy, domestic and international, and about Obama the man. But... Uh, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask, with, by going back to uh, a little bit of what now really feels like ancient history, which is the election campaign and, and Barack Obama's historic victory in November, uh, at that time, I think it was fair to say that even Democrats said, yes, Obama is a once-in-a-generation political campaigner, but can he govern? Can somebody who spent less than one term in the Senate and half of that time campaigning for president really understand Washington well enough to get things done at a time when the country was facing unprecedented challenges at home and abroad. So I wanted, since you're an expert on this, I wanted you to start off by reflecting on sort of the art of Obama's governance. How has he been doing it? How well has he done in populating the administration? How well does he understand executive congressional relations? What's he look like as an inside the beltway politician today? Well, uh, first of all, let me say thank you for having me, Jeff, and thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, I'm in the fourth week of 
the longest extended uh, travels away from my home base uh, in my professional life. And I've traveled uh, based in Melbourne, but off to Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane, Canberra, which I uh, flew from after going through the budget uh, melodrama. It was a fascinating experience. And now uh, here to Sydney. So it's, it's, it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to, uh, to look back home uh, from another country, uh, look through the eyes of uh, non-Americans, but, but also do a little seat of the pants comparative political analysis uh -huh. because there are really interesting parallels uh, between developments in Australia and developments back home. Uh, by the way, you can tell already that as a student of Congress, I am versed in the, in the tactic filibuster. of the filibuster. <laughs> and so I can, uh, you All right, know. So I've got <laughs> the gavel is out. And I have a feeling you would get 60 votes for cloture okay. very right. quickly. Right. So, so let's get on with the business of talking about Obama uh, governing as, a, as opposed to campaigning. It's, it's sort of worth worth keeping in mind that uh, there is no evidence that extended service in the legislature prepares one well for the duties of the presidency of the United States. It's, it's not simply an accident that we've only elected two people directly from the Senate into the White House. Uh, when Obama uh, entered the Senate in January of uh, 2005, uh, he was a phenomenon already because of his speech at the 2004 Democratic Convention. Uh, sort of immensely talented in, in so many ways. And after a while, he made a point of, of, uh, of talking to virtually every member of the Senate and with a special focus on, on Democrats. But he met with members on both sides of the aisle. And interestingly, he was encouraged by some of the most experienced members to to think about running for the presidency now, before he picked up bad habits by mm -hmm. being a senator. Or um, had a voting record <laughs> or anything else that people could pick well, up. Well, exactly. Um, so he, he actually began thinking about it early. And, and I think by you know, the bo second book he wrote, The Audacity of Hope, was really mo uh, more a campaign tune. The first was a serious piece of, uh, of literature. So he. He thought long and hard about it. He's a man of enormous ambition, not in the sense that he satisfies his ego by attaining high office, but really tries to uh, imagine himself having something important to contribute. That can sound very arrogant, uh, but in his, uh, his terms, it's, it's not that, uh, that at all. And he's... He's read uh, seriously uh, in history uh, about presidents and, and uh, successful ones. Uh, uh, he's reminded, uh, he was reminded of Bill Clinton's comment, it's, it's a shame you can't have a great presidency if you don't have any serious crises to deal with. And, and uh, in that sense, uh, he, uh, he looked to uh, Lincoln and uh, Franklin Roosevelt mm -hmm. more as sort of models for uh, for what he would do. Uh, he thought a lot about governing uh, as much as about campaigning and during the course of the campaign, especially, frankly, after his real battle was for the primary, uh, uh, the nomination. Clinton was a truly formidable candidate and could have easily won the nomination, but the stars were arrayed that uh, it would be hard for a Democratic nominee to lose that election. That, there were uncertainties and complications, but he began thinking about uh, how he would govern. It was the most, the most impressive transition by a Democratic uh, uh, president in a long while. Democrats are notoriously bad at preparing to govern. Uh, Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton's transitions were disasters. Um, Republicans have done it much better. And uh, he thought about it. He, he put... John Podesta to work many months before the campaign. Uh, serious planning about, uh, about personnel, uh, about structuring uh, 
the government, the White House, uh, uh, about sequencing the agenda, about choreographing the first weeks and uh, in office. So there's a, a lot of thought how he would relate to Congress uh, uh, and, and the like, so that he went into it better prepared and I think most commentators believed he handled the transition exceedingly well, but then near the end ran into some serious bumps uh, along the way with Tim Geithner and not paying his taxes um, and then Tom Daschle's uh, misfortunes of uh, you know, when you're, when you're Democratic Party leader, any party leader in the Senate, you actually get a car and driver. He thought it came with a job. He didn't pay any taxes on that. And he left the Senate, and soon he, was, he had many things to do, most of which was pro bono um, public policy, but had some well-paid consultancies. And one of them provided car and driver. He didn't report his income, didn't pay taxes. And his candidacy for the health guru was dead. So he, there, were, there were some stumbles. It wasn't perfect, but, but over time what you saw is there was no panic uh, involved when something went wrong. He didn't immediately back away from Geithner facing this. He said, he's my man and I've got to, uh, I've got to go forward, uh, forward with it. So before long, I think he fell uh, fell into a, uh, the kind of opening as president that he had intended to. Remember, the, he began initially running for the presidency uh, against the war in Iraq and to somehow introduce a post-partisan politics to get beyond the, the angry, visceral, ideologically rigid, uh, uh, banal debates that had characterized our politics. So, so if we start, can I just interrupt yeah. you right there? You've, you've mentioned two very important things, but um, Republican critics, uh, and this is not Republicans in Congress, I'm thinking of the Wall Street Journal, for, for example, um, say that there are at least two pieces of evidence to suggest that Obama is not so good at governing. The first one is that it took him six weeks to come up with his own version of the bank bailout bill when every day the stock market was going down and the pressure on him was terrible. So Tim Geithner looked younger and younger with every passing tick down of the, of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So deer in the headlights. There's a big problem. We can't act. The second one is the one, and the reason I, I rudely interrupted you, was the bipartisanship thing. Yeah. Obama didn't only say he was bipartisan. He said he was postpartisan. Right. And, the, and the right in American politics says, here's this postpartisan guy who gives the biggest piece of legislation he's going to get, an $800 billion fiscal stimulus, to the Democrats in Congress asks the Republicans to come to the White House to give their suggestions and then summarily dismisses all of them. So I, I just to be fair and balanced here, those are the, those are the two other sort of governing, governance challenges that the right has, the governance limitations that the right has raised about Obama. How fair do you think those two are? Um, there's some element of truth in the first. There's none in the second. Uh, and let me elaborate. On the first... Uh, Obama intervened uh, to prevent, uh, 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 to ensure that the Congress allowed the second installment of the TARP funds to be released. Uh, he intervened before his inauguration, and he was deeply engaged because, frankly, this is the most unpopular public program in America. There is a visceral populist anger against the bailout, and, frankly, it was in trouble. Uh, uh, so he intervened quickly. Then the question was, would he begin to make the adjustments in the, in the program that, that Secretary Paulson had put in place mm -hmm. under President Bush? Uh, and it took some time. There were problems. There were no Senate-confirmed uh, political appointees in the Treasury to, to assist them. Mind that there were plenty of careerists. There were there were political appointees like Gene Sperling and others who didn't require Senate confirmation. But everything was thrust on Geithner. He was the only one that got through after a very difficult confirmation process himself. Um, uh, he, had the one, he had to make all the public appearances before Congress and everything else and put this package together. And he had to put it together in a way that 
would not require another, uh, uh, an, another congressional appropriation because there wasn't a chance that mm -hmm. he could get any more dollars through. There, frankly, there was great uncertainty about what would work, how to do it. Krugman and Stiglitz are saying, you've got to nationalize the banks. Right. Think through uh, how that would be done, where the resources come from, how it's managed, how it eventually then gets devolved back into the private sector. So I think, it, I think Geithner was uh, unprepared for the, for the spotlights. Uh, he looked young and scared. Uh, I think what was striking to me, though, is that Obama, and this tells you something about him, um, he's prepared to cut his losses when he needs to, but in this case, he decided it would do much more harm to him and the enterprise to, to, to get rid of Geithner and try someone else through the process than it was to, to give him the support to do more himself of the public selling of the plan and, and give them time to develop. They pressured him to go public before he was ready. Mm -hmm eventually got the four pillars of, uh, of the program in place. And frankly, it's, it's, it's credible. It's, and it's politically feasible. Will it work? I don't know. Uh, but there's signs of encouragement. I think they have, they intervened in a way, initially with Bush and Paulson, and then continuing into this administration to, to stop the free fall. And, and while financial institutions have a ways to go to, uh, to be made whole, and we're going to go through some difficult times. And if the recession uh, proves deeper and longer, it will put additional pressure on, on these banks. We may lose more. We're not through it by any means, but we now have in place a, a credible program. And so you can say, yeah, that was a bit of a a bit of a stumble, but they recovered, and they did it in time for the G20 summit. And, uh, and frankly, the U.S. was able to play a leadership role in that, in that setting. Now, on the second one, it's absolute myth. Uh, if, if I were Rahm Emanuel, I would use other language. Uh, uh, if you look, first of all, it's not easy to spend $787 billion uh, quickly. Uh, it's very tough to figure out how to do it. Again, Krugman said it wasn't enough. It had to be $1.2 trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of critics from around, but they had the design of this. They started working on it early before inauguration with key aides on Capitol Hill. Obama's whole approach to Congress is not to conceive of legislation in the executive branch behind closed doors and then present it to Congress. Congress is the first branch of government. And it became broken in part when it deferred too much uh, to the presidency. And, and uh, they're back in the action. Dave Obey worked very closely uh, uh, with other committee chairs, with staffers, and with White House aides to try to shape this program. If you look at the details of that program and then say, what is the basis on which they are saying Congress ran away with this? I'll tell you what. Uh, it's two or three small items. It's like the equivalent of analyzing public finance in America by looking at a half dozen earmarks. Uh, because what, in effect, they were criticizing that got the most play and was eventually taken out was mm -hmm. my favorite stimulus project, which was to resod the National Mall. Yeah. <laughs> Think about it. Shovel ready, jobs creating, and enhancing a public good. I mean... Keynes was prepared, if necessary, to pay people to dig a hole and pay other people to yep. fill, fill in the hole. This was a public good. Americans visit their capital. We had a million and a half people at the inauguration. Uh, you know, it was in terrible shape, but they took it out of it. And then some, there were a couple of other things that were criticized that, in retrospect, turned out to be very sensible investments, in, in, including... Uh, uh, some equipment used up in the Arctic that ends up, uh, ends up being very important. So they handled the public relations on that very badly, but the bill itself was good. Republicans uh, were consulted uh, directly. Uh, more Republicans had met in Congress had met with President Obama in his first 
110 days than, than members of Congress met with President Bush during his eight years. I mean, it, it's really extraordinary. And you can say it's all rhetorical. He's making the gestures. He's not listening. Um, there was a heavier tax component in the House bill because of the Republicans yes. and Democrats were really ticked about it. And the changes that were eventually made in the Senate were, were at the behest of, uh, of Arlen Specter, uh, uh, Susan Collins in particular, and, and they weren't writing better law. They were, they were satisfying some of their own yes. personal, uh, personal interest. Uh, in the end, that stimulus bill, $787 billion, emerged uh, from Congress, signed into law within four weeks of, of his inauguration. It, it was out there quickly. By and large, it's a, it's a good package, and it's good that some of the spending unfolds in years two and three and four, because the odds are this is going to be need it. a slow recovery, yeah. and we're going to need it very much. Here's my take on the bipartisan postpartisanship. Uh -huh. First of all, Obama really overplayed that hand, but it helped him politically mm -hmm. in the campaign. The fact is we are deeply polarized ideologically in our parties. It's rooted in an electorate that's, that's gone through a, a, a series of realignments. Uh, it's, there is a, a political dynamic at work that has, has led to members uh, coming to Congress who, who are very much aligned at their ideological polls. Democrats were the first in the really in the 60s and 70s to move to their poll. It's Republicans since then who've moved much more in that direction. It's very difficult in this environment uh, suddenly changing the politics because the Republicans decided early on and it's fascinating to see the comparison with what's happening here in Australia with the coalition. You're spoiling opposition. all my thunder now. I have these good questions to ask you about uh, But this. I won't say anything about that. In, all right, in, very in, good. In, in, in any case, it, it, they have decided that they were going to pull together, return to their roots, uh, that is the pillars of uh, their public philosophy under Ronald Reagan, that one have run their course, they're no longer responsive uh, to the set of problems that confront the country, and so they weren't really wrestling, understandably, it's, it's a shock, you know, to lose two elections successively. But they entered the negotiations as if, you know, they were on an equal standing with President Obama and large Democratic majorities in the Congress. They had just come off dominating our politics for a quarter century. They lost these, these big elections. Their ideas and their consequences were rejected. Of course, the frame is going to be set by the president and the majority party, but they had opportunities to shape it, and they decided to pull their moderates, remaining moderates back in unified fashion, vote against it, and then say, see, he won't, he won't deal with us. Well, dealing means, you know, accepting most of their ideas, but he ran on a different basis. And, and so what he's going to do is continue to make the outreach, the gestures, to argue, to invite debate, to, uh, to say, why don't you do some work with us? And if they won't, he's going to run over them with his own uh, party. He'll use reconciliation if he has to on health reform to try to pressure them into, into negotiations. But he's going to play the party lever uh, because that's his resource right now, all the while understanding down the road he's going to have to uh, attract some Republicans okay, if so, he's going to be successful. So in a second, let's talk about uh, new American social democracy and how the country's going to pay for it. But I wanted to uh, go back to something you said before about where Obama comes from, which is his pristine anti-Iraq credentials. So 12 months ago or so, actually it was a little after this, I guess, he came up with this exquisite national security pivot, which was how am I going to, at the same time, hold my anti-Iraq base together whilst convincing moderates that I'm tough on national security? And the answer was less Iraq, more Afghanistan. And now we're seeing that policy being executed. It's, not, it's no longer an Afghanistan policy. It's an AFPAC policy. Right. I, I didn't, yeah, I, I'm sure you'd uh, 
you'd be more than willing to give us your views on on you know what's going on in uh, in the Swat Valley and other things. But I wonder, <laughs> I want to ask you, which uh, are worth a great deal, of course. I want to ask you something where you might where where <laughs> you might be on marginally stronger ground, which is how this is going to play with the American public. My sense of Afghanistan in the U.S. is that the American public has been paying no attention to Afghanistan. It was five years of all Iraq all the time, and then six months of global financial crisis. What's going to happen in the U.S. when the American public wakes up to the realities on the ground in Afghanistan? Does the U.S. as a country have the stomach for four and more years of an Afghan climbing an Afghan mountain, which is likely to be at least as tough? As climbing the mountain in Iraq, how do no, you think it's going to they play? They don't have the stomach. Uh, uh, there's very shaky support. You're absolutely right. The the public in polling shows themselves sort of a very modest majority in favor of getting this done. Uh, the nine election, nine eleven connection was real there, uh, unlike Iraq, and and that still carries some weight, but. The reality is their idea of getting it done is a year. Uh, uh, any any uh, uh, historical study of Afghanistan and its occupiers and its uh, presumed conquerors uh, uh, would lead you to be exceedingly pessimistic about uh, about achieving anything close to success. I I think it's more than anything other than a Decade-long global depression. Uh, the mess in Afghanistan and Pakistan is the biggest threat to the viability of the Obama presidency. So, do you think Obama wants to mobilize the country for this fight, or is he trying to lower expectations and 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 figure out a politically and strategic, geostrategically, a viable exit option? But the latter, for certain. He has. Uh, uh, He's a he's a smart politician and look to see he's visible constantly, but he's 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 not he's very careful about what he's asking their help on of sort of public support. He's not he's not talking a lot about TARP and uh, 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 nor is he really uh, talking a great deal about Afghanistan other than announcing you know the policy shift uh, he was making. But they're already in second and third. Uh, Versions of uh, of this, the situation in Pakistan has uh, has deteriorated, um, and and there is, I mean, the fact that Gates fired the the uh, military commander there is a uh, is an indication of uh, of a realization across the board uh, by the political team, the military team, and the president in particular that uh, uh, that. Uh, there is no uh, clear road to uh, to success, and success is going to have to be redefined over time. I'm I'm expecting uh, us to redefine our objectives to avoid uh, avoid the worst, namely the uh, uh, loose nukes uh, in Pakistan, with uh, with the possibility of uh, uh, of uh, of these being used there, but. Getting around elsewhere—it's—it's—it's it's, it's frightening. Uh, it's difficult, and and uh, no no set of issues uh, is as important. I just might mention that uh, a Brookings scholar, Bruce Rydell, was mm-hmm. the person who was called upon to sort of do an independent uh, uh, study of this. There are others that uh, affiliate with with Brookings who are who are. Much more pessimistic about the about the prospects uh, there, and and uh, there's a lot of rethinking about how we're going to handle it.